Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin. Co-hosting with me today is Kristen Palacy, chiropractic practitioner, new doula, and mother. And our guest today is Laura Ehrlich. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. You are a specialist in Chinese medicine, and you focus on infertility, obstetrics, and women's health in general. Um, and in addition to practicing, you also teach, and you also wrote a book, Feed Your Fertility, which is the first of apparently many books coming from you. Well, let's hope. Yeah. Um, tell me more. First of all, how did you get interested in Chinese medicine? Uh, it was a fairly organic evolution, I would say. I uh, did my undergraduate degree in classical theater and upon graduating, quickly discovered that that meant I was a college-educated waitress for most of my life. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I started looking for something else. It helps else. with uh, calculating the total some things. Yes, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, presenting yourself at all times. Um, but I started looking for something that I would find a little bit more intellectually stimulating. I was living in New York at the time, and so I decided to attend the Swedish Institute of Massage Therapy. Oh, yeah. Famous. And uh, the famous, famous, famous school, um, and I kind of, and a big part of that curriculum was actually an introduction to the meridian system, the basics of Chinese medicine, uh, and learning shiatsu massage. So I kind of fell in love with Chinese medicine through that training. And then as soon as I graduated, I, I found an interest in prenatal massage while I was studying there. And then I kind of hooked up with a couple of women who were doulas that were becoming midwives, and they were also massage therapists. So I began studying with them and learned labor massage and uh, postpartum techniques for helping women with various conditions. And then I started apprenticing with them, uh, and then eventually... A couple of years later, moved back to Los Angeles and became a doula. And then I tried to do all the things. I was doing um, doula work. I was had a massage practice, and I was doing repertory theater. Oh wow! And I, <laughs> you never dropped the theater. I no. I, I initially I did. I attempted to do it all, and then I sort of woke up at the end of one arduous season on call, stressed out of my mind. And my, you know, uh, something's got to give here. I have to choose. And holistic medicine was just more of a calling, ultimately. And um, I'm super grateful for my theater background, but was definitely ready to let it go. Do you feel like your theater background helps you in practice? Oh, tremendously. Uh, I think it helps me as a communicator with my patients. And, I, you know, my interest was always classical theater, so I, I'm classically trained with a big focus in Shakespeare. And I think I'm a very linguistic person. I, I learned Spanish in an immersion program starting in kindergarten. So I think I'm somebody who's always had an ear for language and trying to understand difficult concepts and being able to convey them to people. So um, I don't know if you know this. I have a theater background as well. Oh, That's really? I, I didn't know that. In, in college, I was a drama major. Um, but I, I And I never expected to do theater or drama, but then here we are with a podcast and a YouTube series well, and documentaries absolutely. and a comedy show and it just sort <laughs> yeah, of, yeah. here you go. You never get rid of it. Really. No, you don't. And I'm so grateful for it because I feel like, I don't, I'm sure you feel this way too. I think it's one of the things that has set me apart as a practitioner because I'm not afraid to get up and teach and talk about things. To And thank goodness for that because you have so much valuable information that's hard to come by, which is why I'm so glad to have you here today. Thank you. I really want to pick your brain about Chinese medicine in general, okay. and then probably in our second half, Chinese medicine specific to the various stages of pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum breastfeeding. Okay. Um, I mean, you know so much about it. It's what you live and breathe every day, and you every teach. Day. And, and, teach. and you mm -hmm. teach other acupuncturists in Chinese medicine. So if we'd start with the basics, Chinese medicine as a label, what's under that umbrella? What's under that umbrella is really a series of modalities that are all come together to treat the whole person. And so that includes acupuncture, of course, uh, herbal medicine. And I would say those are the kind of the two primary things that we think of with Chinese medicine. But in addition to that, there's a, a whole nutrition component with Chinese medicine. There is um, uh, body work techniques like twina, gua sha, cupping. Those are all more... Uh, modalities that tend to be used for musculoskeletal conditions or various pain issues as well. So if we can break them down, acupuncture, starting with acupuncture, for people who are not familiar with acupuncture, how mm -hmm. do you define it? What is it? Um, in the simplest terms, acupuncture is the insertion of very fine, sterile, one-time-use needles 
and to various points along the body that uh, comprise what we call a, a meridian system or a channel system. And the to me, the most... Um, appropriate comparison would be the cardiovascular system in our body or the nervous system in the body, meaning your blood flows to every cell in your body. It interacts with every cell in your body, moves in and out. Same with our nervous system. The nerves start somewhere, but then they end up touching every cell in the body. And we can't really live or function without those systems being in place. Uh, the meridian system is kind of like that. It's a thoroughfare of energy that travels through the body. And it also interacts with and touches every cell, every organism within the body. So and except for anomalies, every person has the same map of blood flow. Every person has the same map of blood flow. You have your major nerve superhighways, and then coming off of them, there are branches. And we all have the same branches. So they're named and labeled. And, and you can predict if something's going on with one particular uh, roadway, then you're going to have very specific symptoms. And if you correct that, then those symptoms can go away. And the meridian system functions exactly the same way. With we all have the same energy. meridians. We all have the same roadways. We all have the same points along them. And they can become blocked just in the same way that a physical part of the body can become blocked. And essentially, if we can rebalance that system, if you think about, if you think about like an electric fence, for mm -hmm. example, an electric fence is shuttling energy back and forth. If there's a place in that fence where it, the electrical line gets broken, then the electricity can't make it across, right? It's going to get stuck right there. So the use of needles, which are made of metal, are great conductors of that electricity. And so by finding a place where there's not enough energy coming through, or maybe there's a surge of energy, there's too much coming through, and using the needles to kind of modulate that, Mm. The way that that energy goes back and forth, you've essentially fixed that spot in the fence where things are broken, and the whole thing can go back to kind of smoothly flowing. And you do that with those tiny needles. We do that with those tiny needles and the where, where we choose to put them. And there are different techniques. There are different approaches to acupuncture. I practice a more classical style of acupuncture that's looking at the meridian system as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, a holistic acupuncture. <laughs> Yeah, if you will. <laughs> the the more contemporary acupuncture, which um, has evolved since the People's Revolution in China, when uh, General Mao, who took over, decided that he wanted Western medicine and Eastern medicine to be far more similar, mm. changed a lot of things about the way Chinese medicine was taught. Oh, interesting. And so um, it became a little bit more like Western medicine, where we kind of say, like, a pill for every ill. Mm -hmm. Chinese medicine kind of became a point for every ill. So I can oh, choose wow. this point for cramps and that point for headaches and this point for nausea, as opposed to the more classical approach, which has a lot of influence from Taoism and, Ooh, uh, and a more kind of spiritual perspective, um, that was eliminated from the vernacular and from the pedagogy because they didn't want it to seem too esoteric. And I so the, I got the tagline, a stick for every egg. <laughs> thank you very much. That's a good one. Well, thank you very much. I do want to point out these needles are tiny, right? Um, I don't love being poked by needles. I don't like having blood drawn. Um, oddly enough, I don't mind doing it to other people, but I don't have mm -hmm. a problem. I don't love needles being stuck into my body. Mm -hmm. um, acupuncture needles, needles don't typically bother me at all. No, they're and very they're different. they're so thin. They're like a hair. You could uh, flex it like a, like a hair. Mm -hmm. And you can fit a whole bunch of them into the hypodermic needle that they use to draw blood. I think sometimes people picture needles like yeah, they get tons of needles that. poking out of you like a, like a pin cushion. Yep. Um, so acupuncture is one of several modalities under Chinese medicine. And then you also talked about herbal medicine. Mm -hmm. How are Chinese herbs different than other herbs that, that exist? Um, they're not different in so far as the plants are necessarily so different. There's a tremendous amount of crossover between, say, Ayurvedic herbs, Chinese herbs, even Western herbs. The, the thing that makes Chinese herbal medicine its own thing is that the herbs are used in formulas. So a lot of times with Western medicine, we see herbs used, or Western herbology, it, you'll use a single herb. You'll, you'll use red raspberry leaf, for example, mm -hmm. and just use that. In Chinese medicine, we are always combining herbs together, and it's the energetic relationship between the herbs in addition to the actual physical properties of the herbs that causes the impact that you're trying Whoa, to Well, that's a heavy sentence. Can you break it down? Sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
So by using a lot of different herbs together, we're creating a, a medicinal effect that is different than if you just took one at a time. So if I were to combine something that causes the blood to, say, quicken a little bit, but that simultaneously I'm using um, – an, another herb that maybe causes the blood to be nourished or mm-hmm. to bring more um, nutrients, then I'm using these two things together to quickly deliver more nutrients, nutrients okay. to a specific part of the body. And the sages and masters that came up with this Materia Medica thousands of years ago, and the Materia Medica is basically the big compendium of herbs that are part of the Chinese medical pharmacopoeia, um, they really related to these herbs in an energetic sense. So they're not just looking at like, oh, this herb has whatever specific molecular chemical compounds that have a physiologic effect. They're saying this herb will increase your energy, your chi, for example, or that this herb will clear emotional blockages, or this herb might, I don't know, whatever it is, help to transform somebody from a state of physical pain to a state of non-pain. Um, but in an energetic sense, not just in a literal sense. Now, interestingly enough, as time's gone by and we've had the opportunity to study these in a more molecular way, the things that they were said to do, they really do. That's so that's really the other kind of amazing thing. I mean, even how with, far back do these uh, herbs date? The use of Chinese herbs? I think uh, close to three thousand years wow. in terms of what we have written down. So they didn't even have Google. They didn't have Google. <laughs> there was no Dr. Google at amazing. that time where people could it's amazing how second they guess it you. Out. Or, yeah. Yep. Is there interplay between the herbs and the acupuncture? You know, that's an interesting question. I, I strongly believe that there is to the degree that um, – the acupuncture is the driver of the resources and the herbs are the resources themselves. So hmm. the acupuncture, if I'm choosing an acupuncture prescription for somebody, I am trying to direct their chi and their blood and whatever vital you know, essences that they have in their body to, to a certain area or to a certain channel system because that's where I see that there's an imbalance. And then I'm choosing herbs that resonate with that as well. That's, it's different in the West than it is in China, though, because in China, you are either an herbalist or an acupuncturist. Oh, really? Yeah, I'm you don't do, both do not come together. Well, it's like over here. Like, you can't just be an orthopedist. You have to be a thumb specialist. Yeah, exactly. Like, down to the, <laughs> oh, not just the thumb. I'm the, the nail The particular guy. joint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh. It's like just this one right here. Um, and in China, herbs are used for internal medicine, and acupuncture is used for more physical medicine. Uh, so... Typically, you wouldn't be using herbs to treat. I mean, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Yeah, you wouldn't be using herbs to treat back pain necessarily, and you wouldn't be using acupuncture to treat well, preeclampsia or, or nausea or things. infertility or yeah. recurrent pregnancy loss. You'd only use herbs for that. Now, because in the West everybody is so stressed out, and because from my perspective, the autonomic nervous system is the real player here—that fight or flight versus rest and relax state that people are in. And, the more we can be in the rest and relax mode, the more our bodies have the capacity to heal. And I think that that's where acupuncture shines. Acupuncture literally transitions people, even if it's only for half an hour once a week, into that state where their body recognizes like, oh, I'm okay. Everything's okay. Mm. And from here, I can heal. I can my body has the capacity within itself to change wow. or to do what it needs to do. I would do. take five minutes once a month. Five yeah. minutes, once a month. I'm glad you noticed you, that other people Elliot. are stressed out, not just me. <laughs> I thought it was just me. You mentioned the herbal pharmacopoeia, mm-hmm. which sounds like something I want to buy for my family for Thanksgiving. It's not. A pharmacopoeia. Um, but it's it, – how many herbs are there? Are we talking about a dozen herbs, hundreds oh, no. of herbs? Hundreds and hundreds of herbs. I'm, I mean – and they're not just single herbs, here, right? Yeah, of course. Blends well, and... So there's single herbs, and that's – in school we learn single herbs – by category, and I would imagine in the single herb department, we're learning at least four or five hundred. And again, we're just learning what's what we're being tested on for the state board. So, as a practitioner, I've learned you know about lots and lots of different herbs or a lot of herbs that are not used anymore because they're toxic and you know we don't want to poison people. Um, or yeah. there are a lot of herbs that are do no harm, do no harm is the goal. Um, 
there's a lot of herbs that are derived from animal products and things that are now considered taboo, and we don't use those here in the states. Oh, really? But they are. I was wondering how, the, like, you you deal with quality control and safety. Yeah, quality control is is um, really really important to me as a practitioner who's working primarily with women who are either trying to become pregnant or already are pregnant. So quality control is vital. I manage quality control by by using vendors that are testing all of their products already. So I don't use I don't use raw herbs in their dry bulk form. Even though there are some vendors out there who do assure that those products are safe and et cetera, you know, I, we know that the planet is pretty polluted at this mm-hmm. point. So I would rather so give test- my patients a product that has gone through a rigorous testing system. So I use, in the when I'm prescribing single herbs and combining them together to make a formula, uh, I use freeze-dried granules. So they've already... Somebody picked them, and then they decocted them into a tea, mm-hmm. and then they tested that final batch of product for, for purity and purity potency. for pollutants, for heavy metals, for um, making sure that it's actually the herb it's supposed to be. So we know the whole molecular chemical breakdown, and we know that it's passed the test of being safe to ingest, and then they freeze dry it. So oh, what wow. we get are these granules of the herbs already made into a tea. And you put, oh, it's a tea. And then you just tea. add water okay. and drink it. So and that's you could, one you way. you could mix various granules to create a, a multi Right, formula. so that's what I do. I have like a big wall of herbs oh. in my pharmacy. Does and it smell when it's freeze-dried, like that, that um, herbal? It doesn't smell the way it does when you're at home boiling it in your ceramic kettle and then it reeks up your whole house. It certainly smells when you're going to drink it. No, but I've walked into herbal <laughs> herbal dispensaries that, that have that have the fresh different. herbs, and it smells kind of amazing in there. You just yes, yeah. yeah. So these don't smell the same way because they're in freeze dried. I mean, they're in Granules. little packets that you can't you can't smell them when you first until you open the pack. You don't smell them. Hmm. Um, but when something pills. is freeze dried, it's at the highest potency or the highest it is uh, yeah it's highly concentrated so it's just you just have to add back a little bit of water and then drink it that way the formulas i mean the herbs that we use the vendor that we use actually um supplies the hospitals in hong kong for example so you know i'm a big stickler about finding the highest quality I, i also use a lot of capsules because even just reconstituting herbs with water they still taste pretty bad to the western palate I was amazed when I visited China and Korea that the the herbs that we like plug our noses over and gag and think are so disgusting they cook with. Oh, so really? it's just part of on their, their pasta. Then just you know like chicken that's made with like oh. angelica, dongue, or other herbs that we would never consume for the flavor. We would mm-hmm. just consume for the medicinal purposes of it. That's interesting. So for them, it doesn't taste gross. Interesting. Well, mm-hmm. we have different palettes. I, I think all acupunctures are sticklers. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I'll be here all night. Um, <clears throat> moving on. You have to learn Chinese to some degree. Mm-hmm. Is that true? I mean, it's a mm. difficult language because I watch Ni Hao Kai Lan, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so we get, a, we get like a very baby version of Chinese. There are some amazing scholars in our field who have – taken the time to truly learn Chinese and to be able to translate the texts. And that's why we have access to so much of this information. Um, I have not done that. But but you still have to learn some <laughs> Chinese to, to be able to... We have to learn what's called pinyin. So, mm-hmm. um, And sometimes when people will ask me what an herb is, and I, I kind of only know the name in pinyin. I can't always remember like the Latin translation, but there's, there's the pinyin, which is essentially the Chinese characters translated into close enough English. So okay. Dong Gui, for example, is... Or Dong Kwai, some people call it. But Dong Gui is the pinyin version of that. I see. Mm-hmm. It's, it's sort of um, but it's really Angelica. Angelica is the Latin name of that. Or Bai Shao is peony. So That's what we I learn. Thought. What's it's that? very similar That's what sounding. I thought. Bai Shao just sounds like peony. Yeah, yeah. doesn't it? <laughs> so that's what we have to learn in school. We have to figure out, you know, through a variety of acronyms and other ways of remembering, yeah. um, you know, what the different, what the pinion is, what the Latin is, what the English is, what the properties are, what the energetics are, what they do, how, what you combine really, them with. Um, it's crazy. It's a lot to know. 
Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, you also did massage and, you know, just thinking about all the muscles and the origin, insertion, action, mm-hmm. that's a lot to know. But with the herbs, there's so many and there's and, and there's so many properties related to them. And I imagine some go well together and some don't Yeah, go you do well have together. to know about interactions. But I think as with any specialty, I mean, gosh, if I was trying to do like cardiology and pediatrics and whatever else, you know, whatever other specialty simultaneously, I would probably lose my mind. I have a very basic understanding of what to give someone if they have high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. But that's not my specialty. So if somebody was really hypertensive and I couldn't get in front of it, I'd send them to someone who specializes in that. So Mm -hmm. as a specialist, there are, you know, a handful of formulas that I use and modify on a regular basis, maybe 20, as opposed to the hundreds that I had to learn in school. And you see the same things over and over again, which are the things we're going to talk about shortly. Yeah. Um, You mentioned a third component because we talked about acupuncture with those tiny hair thin needles. We talked about (laughs) in the meridians. We talked about herbal medicine. Uh, And then you said there are some body work modalities like Mm -hmm. tweenon, cupping. Can you tell me a little bit more about those? Yeah. So those are modalities that we often use to deal with musculoskeletal conditions, much like you guys. I mean, there's even an, a component of it that typically isn't practiced in the West, and I'm not trained in it at all, but that's quite similar to chiropractic, where mm-hmm. they are like doing moving bones and adjusting. Well, because um, we live in California, I do some herbal medicine. Oh, yeah. See, there you go. But I do not adjust people. <laughs> but not at the <laughs> I office. Send them to you. I just not that's at the out office. of my realm. <laughs> just on Melrose. Yeah. Um, so Twina is, it, it's kind of a big umbrella, really. I mean, it's body work in general. It's body work along specific channels. There's a variation of Twina specific to pediatrics that mm. uses little tiny tools to kind of get the meridians activated without using needles. Uh, cupping is using suction cups that can be, we can either these days use like a pump to pump up the, to the suction or fire cupping, which is the traditional method where you take a, like, it's like a little glass fish bowl and you light a cotton ball on fire yeah. and you stick it in the cup and then you stick it on the person's back or where wherever part of them you're treating and it creates this suction. Yeah, where and you don't feel the heat, but it sucks out all the air. You don't feel the, the heat, air. but it sucks all the air out. It creates a vacuum. And when you place it on the skin, it makes a big suction of the skin. It generally causes big purple round marks. Giant hickeys. Giant hickeys. But, Most uh, people have seen them on TV on various celebrities. I remember, the, yeah, Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah, the Gwyneth Oscars. Paltrow on the red and carpet. And a lot of athletes recently. A lot of athletes, you know, over the yeah. years. So you it's can, typically it's used also for great pain. for playing Twister on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> All those little spots. Um, red hand on deep purple. It was, yeah. <laughs> It works great for <laughs> for muscle spasms, for back pain, for um, actually really, really well for lung conditions like bronchitis, pneumonia, um, that kind of thing. What's the theory, the though? What's that? What's the theory of, of cupping? What is it physiologically it's doing? It's physiologically pulling the fascia and bringing a ton of blood flow into an area where there's stagnation. And Ooh. then when you release it, it's releasing it all. So it's it's not too dissimilar from you know, sticking your elbow into a point for a long period of time. And then when you release it, you get a big rush of blood oh. in, which clears out all of the, so the toxins. Sounds like a combination of, uh, yeah, it sounds like a reverse massage. Instead of kind pushing of is a in, reverse like massage. Sucking sucking up. Up. Yeah. That's a good way to think of it. Yeah, it's, it's pulling toxicity out of the muscle tissue, out of the fascia, and kind of helping it to unstick so that then you can get more blood flow. So when somebody goes to visit an acupuncturist or a Chinese medical practitioner, these are basically the tools of the trade? For the most part. Yeah, as and nutrition as well. Not all acupuncturists deal in nutrition. I do a lot of nutrition. N- nutrition in terms of, uh, what do you mean by that? Um, I mean, really taking a look at people's diets and figuring out if they're eating appropriately for whatever it is that they're trying to do. A lot of women who are trying to become pregnant, for example, are not eating enough fat and protein in their diets. They're trying to not gain any weight or whatever they're doing. You know, there's um, and there's a specific Chinese medicine approach to nutrition that um, tends to kind of veer away from veganism, for example, and says that most people really need those those resources from some animal product. It doesn't necessarily mean that they can't be vegetarian, but that it requires a lot of conscious planning if that is um, the way that you're eating. And uh, But I think that's true in general. If you cut out anything from the from the food supply, then absolutely. you probably have to take whatever nutrients would have been there and find another way to right. 
Right. But some things are hard to replace. So when you completely take out some of the um, essential fatty acids and things that you find in certain animal products, it's hard to replace those in nature. And I know there's a lot of vegans out there who disagree with that, but that's the Chinese perspective about on it. Um, so kind of looking at people's diets, what they're eating, making sure they're eating enough and frequently enough, mm. a lot of nutrition in the first trimester to help manage nausea and fatigue and those kinds of symptoms, kind of trying to stay in front of it rather than um, waiting until the nausea really kicks in and then trying to figure out how to get rid of it. My nutritionist is a huge believer in lots of different colors in the yeah. diet, eating lots of different colors. But then I found out sprinkles don't count. They don't. Darn it. That would be so great. Neither do crunch berries. They did. Right? Every morning? There's That'd be Every awesome. color. Sprinkle. <laughs> so sprinkles colors. on your crunch berries. Yeah, yeah. of course. <laughs> Uh, Laura, I've already learned so much about the basic understanding of Chinese medicine. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I really want to dig next into your expertise into the pre- and postnatal uh, specialty. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back with Laura Ehrlich. Kristen, all of us are trying to eat healthier. We're trying to live more active lifestyle. I have young kids. You just had your first baby. And uh, it's really difficult sometimes to eat healthy, to get good, nutritious, non-GMO, non-toxic, healthy, organic foods. Um, It's hard because it's expensive. It's hard because it's time-consuming. And dragging the kids out to the store is just really difficult to do. You must feel that way. I definitely feel that way. A friend of mine turned me on to my new favorite online store. It's called Thrive Market. And Thrive Market has done a lot of the work for us. They carefully curate their products so that they are non-toxic. They are organic products. You don't have to sit there looking at labels to figure out which ones are good and which ones aren't good. And they have the most unique and interesting products. My family loves to go on there and do a little scavenger hunt. The kids look for items on my phone. They get the app, and they like to look for items that they like that they haven't seen before. I like to look for items. And my wife, total health nut, looks for totally different items. And we're all really happy when the box arrives. We get the Thrive Market box, and everybody's really excited to open it up and see what's inside. That sounds so great. And it's 25 to 50% off, and it's shipped straight to your door. I couldn't believe how much money we saved on our first order alone. And guess what? What? I would like to give you a gift, $60 in free groceries at Thrive Market, and free shipping, and a 30-day trial membership. That's so great. All you have to do is go to thrivemarket.com slash Berlin. You're going to really love everything that you find at Thrive Market. And in addition to being a great company that saves me a lot of time and a lot of money and helps me eat better and helps me feed my kids better, Thrive Market also gives back to the community. They donate a membership to a low-income family, a veteran, or a teacher for every account created. Visit thrivemarket.com slash Berlin, and you too can get $60 in free organic groceries shipped directly to your door for free with a 30-day trial membership. thrivemarket.com slash Berlin. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, here with co-host Kristen Palacy and our guest, Laura Ehrlich. We're talking about herbology and Chinese medicine for pregnancy and birth and postpartum. So the first thing that comes to mind is, I mean, you mentioned earlier uh, acupuncture, herbal medicine, and body work. Herbal medicine is one that gets everybody nervous because during pregnancy, Everybody who makes any product, no matter what it is, always says on there, you know, be cautious during pregnancy or ask your medical doctor before you touch this product or take it or breathe it or sleep on it. Um, And my sense is that when you ask your medical doctor about Chinese herbs that they can't pronounce and never heard of before, there's no way that they can give you an informed answer about that. So how do we know? I mean, are the herbs safe to use during pregnancy? Not safe? Are some safe and others not safe? Well, I think that it's very, very important to work with a trained herbalist in the same way that you would work with a trained medical doctor. So, you know, you wouldn't go and get a prescription for a pharmaceutical medication from somebody who didn't have the training to provide that to you. And in the same way, you probably wouldn't ask your acupuncturist whether or not you should change your dose of Synthroid. That's the the doctor's job. And Mm so um, one of the things that, you know, as a profession, I think we're still working on is 
helping people to understand the level of training that goes into being a Chinese herbal medicine practitioner and the amount of not only knowledge we have to have, but sourcing information, as we were talking about before, making sure that things are clean and safe and um, not going to harm the body. And it is challenging because Western physicians often don't realize the extent that we are trained and that we understand the herb and drug interactions if patients are taking pharmaceuticals, for example, or that we understand that they're pregnant and that there are certain things that they shouldn't take because they're pregnant. So uh, I think first and foremost, it's really important that people don't self-prescribe. And we can find anything online now and we can Google anything about anything. And, you know, when I have so often I get emails and text messages from my patients saying, can I take this too? And how about if I take that? And, oh, I got this thing at CVS. And I'm, <laughs> you know, my answer is always, please no, because I'm already accounting for all of that stuff. All the things that you're seeking more and more and more for, I'm already accounting for that in the prescription that I'm providing mm -hmm. for you and the plan that we are making. So I think one thing is that there's it's really important to try. You know, work with a practitioner that has a good reputation, that you do trust, that you know has a solid background. And then as consumers, we have to decide for ourselves, am I going to look to the plumber to fix my heater or am I going to trust that the plumber is just going to deal with the plumbing? And so – we have to get to a place as a society where we accept that Chinese medicine practitioners are, in fact, highly trained medical providers. In the state of California, we're considered primary care physicians. Like We have a, a tremendous amount of medical training. Well, so, that's an important note. You don't have to go to your doctor no, you to don't. get a referral to Chinese medicine. Right. Not in California. In other states, I'm sure that's not the case. But in California, we're considered primary care providers. And, and, and you know, if you go to Asian countries, there's there's such a strong belief in Chinese medicine and Chinese medicine and Western practitioners are side by side. If you go to a hospital, they're making decisions and you're receiving herbs and you're receiving Western medicine together. And here that's just not part of our culture yet. So no. that's where a lot of the, the confusion and the fear comes from. But I think beyond that, the self-prescription and the sort of blanket nose that come from the Western medical community, rather than really taking the time to meet with practitioners in their community and understand what it is they're providing. The well, I think times are changing because one of my favorite places to eat is a restaurant called Chicken Chow, which both has like fried chicken and Chinese food. <laughs> so, For sure. It could I saw, be a sign. I saw teriyaki bowls and pastrami when I was driving home oh, yesterday, okay. actually, in one, <laughs> under one roof. Like, See, oh, okay. Welcome to California. It starts here and then it spreads out. <laughs> So, like I mean, so many people. It's a great, yeah, exactly. It's a great point. Well, I would never, you know, you don't go to your your OBGYN and ask about Don Quai, just the same way you don't go to your acupuncturist and ask, should I take my antidepressant? During, yeah. During if a pregnancy. patient asks me if they should go off the antidepressants, I tell them to call their psychiatrist. Right. But I trust that their psychiatrist is a board certified trained psychiatrist. And so, what we're missing in the culture here is for. Uh, OBGYNs to trust that the acupuncturist that you're seeing is a board certified trained acupuncturist and understands what they're doing and, and has the same obligation to do no harm. And, and you know, we have an acupuncturist in the office also. He has so many books mm -hmm. and they're big, <laughs> heavy books. And it, it's never ending, the amount of research and education and understanding that goes into it. It's, 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 it's vast amount of yeah, knowledge. Yeah, we can go. On. You made an interesting point also that, like, go out and make sure you find somebody who is or specializes. So how would somebody, if they're listening and wants to find a specialist, an, an acupuncture, an ac acupuncturist who specializes in uh, pregnancy or prenatal, how what's the best way to do that and make sure? Is there that a formal specialty? There is a formal specialty currently. It's it's growing in the U.S., but it is um, so far we don't have a lot of differentiation in our training. There's a move in that direction, but the training is not such that you graduate from school with a specialty per se. I knew what my specialty was going to be because I was already a doula. I was already a prenatal massage therapist. I kind of went in with blinders on and focused on this very specifically. So I had a little bit of an advantage coming out into the community. Um, that said, there is a formal board certification that a lot of practitioners choose to go through called the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine, oh. of which I am a fellow. Um, and so technically speaking, I am a board certified fellow of this American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. And what I had to do to get to that point was sit for a super hard exam that essentially demonstrated my proficiency in reproductive medicine. 
right now the board is more focused on infertility than obstetrics, but most practitioners that I, most of my colleagues that are fellows of the board, their practice continues well into the um, obstetric period, sure. even if they don't go all the way through pregnancy. So that's the, a good place to start because in most communities, you'll find somebody that's aborm.org to start So they'll list looking. the people that are fellows. So there's a list of fellows um, there that you can find. And so I would say, by and large, those are the the people who are the most focused on the specialty. But it doesn't mean that, you know, somebody who's living in another community and has really dedicated their time to working in obstetrics um, or infertility and hasn't sat for this exam isn't also equally capable, uh, well, we hope that more and more people will do it so that we can start to differentiate. There's also like an orthopedic board, for example, but there's not a lot yet of... And chiropractic too. There's not... Um, yes. There's not... You don't finish and then go for a long fellowship um, right. like medicine. It's we don't get to do residencies. Way. We kind of just get thrown to the wolves. I'm sure it's the same for you guys. Like yep. start a business and yeah. find a specialty. Go. And you're like, what? <laughs> so <clears throat> I, I feel really fortunate because I it was always clear for me. Um, so I just want to spend the next 20 minutes walking through a pregnancy to okay. sort of give examples of some of the scope of what we can do with Chinese medicine throughout pregnancy. In the first trimester, you, you're of a mostly prenatal practice and so are we. In the first trimester, the most common things people come in with are nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Is there a Chinese medical approach? Absolutely. There's a Chinese medical approach. and. The thing about Ch the Chinese medical approach is it's going to be different for every single person. You know, so while there is a sort of compendium of herbs and acupuncture points I'm looking at, I'm going to base my treatment protocol on the way that person is presenting that day. And one of the ways I go about doing that is I feel their pulse and I look at their tongue and I talk to them and see how they're feeling. I'm looking at the color of their complexion, you know, are they pale? Are they looking kind of like green because they're so nauseated? Do they have big bags under their eyes? And so it's really at that point becomes, in addition to choosing the right points to help manage whatever that nausea is, and oftentimes uh, we refer to it as rebellious stomach chi. Hmm. And so we're choosing points to help descend the, the stomach chi. But often that's not enough. There's also very frequently a big emotional component to the first trimester as well, at least among my patient population, most of whom have gone through some type of a fertility struggle. Mm -hmm. So they're battling all of that too. They're very frequent doctor's appointments and getting monitored really closely. And so there's a, there's a whole big stress and fear component that often comes into the first trimester as well. That's probably not true for the average lucky 26-year-old who just wanted to get pregnant and then sneezed and got pregnant. But mm -hmm. in my population, that's not the case. So most people worked really hard to get there. And so that stress and fear is definitely playing a role in how they're feeling. And I have so some that patients we're who don't even sneeze. That. What's that? I have some patients that don't even sneeze. <laughs> that don't even, yeah. yeah they're just <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, so uh, that's interesting. It's different from person to person. And those those diagnostic tools that you use, like I use a pulse to tell if somebody's alive or dead, but right. you can learn so much more in your training on the quality of, of the pulse and, Correct. and yeah. tongue readings. Um, and fatigue as well. Fatigue as well. Oftentimes fatigue, you know, look, to a degree, it's par for the course. We can't completely take it away, but it's about helping people figure out ways to manage it better. Herbs, if possible, when somebody's really nauseous, herbs are a challenge. And so then I kind of turn to a little bit more of a Western herbal approach by doing things like single herbs like boiled ginger or peppermint or um, uh, I like to use rose and mint together because it has a physical calming effect in addition to kind of being a little bit uh, anti-nausea and cooling. So people are mm -hmm. vomiting a lot or having acid reflux. That's a little bit more helpful than ginger, which is a really hot herb, and we wouldn't necessarily use that. So, um, What happens sometimes, um, there's medical approaches as well. There's uh, pharmaceutical prescriptions mm -hmm. um, when nausea and vomiting gets um, intense to mm -hmm. the point where it becomes dysfunctional or really uncomfortable. Uh, is there a way to understand how the pharmaceuticals and the herbs will interact with each other? Absolutely. And we have a lot of research on all of that. Typically speaking, the um, in the first trimester, we're looking at, at things like vitamin B6 combined with, um, for all intents and purposes, Benadryl. You know, mm -hmm. that's what most people are starting with for nausea. And then 
and the combination, for whatever reason, for some people, has that kind of anti nausea effect or anti-medic yeah. effect. Zofran is sometimes used, but I don't know about you. I'm seeing that used less and less because there's some research that's linking it to some adverse out- fetal outcomes. So mm-hmm. um, Zofran seems like we're dissuading people away from that. It's a heavy hitter, and it also seems to prevent some some of the vomiting, but not necessarily the nausea. And so yeah. sometimes that ends up being counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. I find with most of my patients, no, there, of course it's a spectrum, and sometimes you have people who are so sick that they're vomiting, you know, for the, and they really need Western intervention. They need IV fluids. They need to be on really heavy duty drugs. For the average morning sickness person, I think it's really about eating very frequently, eating every two hours. If you wake up in the middle of the night nauseous, you get up and have a snack then too. That's my it's, lifestyle. It's, and mine. <laughs> and I've never had nausea and vomiting <laughs> You've never had a pregnancy, baby either. So. How did this happen? <laughs> Must work. What about in the second trimester, there's more pain, discomfort, sometimes headaches pop up in the first and second trimester, mm-hmm. swelling. Um, you mentioned the body work techniques to use yeah. those during pregnancy. Body work is great for the second trimester, especially they're starting to experience when the baby kind of pops over the top of the pubic bone and there's a little bit more of a change in posture. So um, massage is great during that time. Between uh, acupuncture works really well for that as well. Cupping Heat, during pregnancy? Moxibustion. Cupping during pregnancy is okay, uh, but not. I don't use cupping in the lower back until we're trying to get labor going. Oh, really? Not generally, or if if I do use it, it would be very light cupping mm-hmm. um, that's just trying to move things. But I think that massage and having a little bit more control over the the depth of pressure and stuff is for me more comfortable. How about the like the carpal tunnel I symptoms that point you. up or the swelling? Carpal legs? tunnel we mostly use um, acupuncture and some massage for that as well. Hot and cold. Do you, you know, get good people. results, or is it just kind of managing that symptom? It depends on the severity. I have some patients where it's only been management, and they get relief like for a few hours or a day, and then you know it's kind of back to it. Some of it's their their maintenance of their own condition, and are they wearing braces when they go to sleep, and are they, you know, doing all the things that they need to do to to manage and prevent it. And for some people, it's just intractable. I'm sure you guys find that too, and it's so frustrating, but. And There's, how about herbs for that? Is there like for because it's a lot of like water retention? Yeah, absolutely. We could definitely use herbs. That's we have herbs. to be careful on the anti di, anti diuretic. I mean, the diuretic stuff is okay. Okay. Um, but I don't use anything purgative, so it's kind of finding that fine line where you wouldn't want to do anything that would purge the intestines because that could potentially start contractions. But mm. helping somebody, um, you know, just lose some water for sure is effective. And and I do that a lot with. Just having them add electrolytes as well, you know, high quality electrolytes all day to their drinks and make their own electrolyte solutions and um, stay physically active as well. You know, sedentary pregnancies, I think, cause a lot more problems than active pregnancies. When uh, more of the diagnostics take place, like later in the second trimester or as you're moving into the third trimester, uh, blood sugar, blood pressure. Um, you know, sometimes it's just mildly high or low and controlled with diet or exercise. Sometimes it's more extreme. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there Chinese medical remedies for those? Definitely. I mean, I start, I, I ideally start preparing my patients for things like gestational diabetes, blood sugar management as soon as they stop being nauseous. You know, I don't really hound them about it too much when they are trying to get anything in. Mm-hmm. Um, although I have guidelines that I hope they can try to adhere to, but some people only can eat mashed potatoes. And if that's the case, then just eat the mashed potatoes <laughs> you got to eat. Yeah. I was such you a know. mashed potato eater. <laughs> oh, me too, right? That's what you bring up, the mashed, mashed potatoes, potatoes and Cheerios. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Um, but, you know, as people start to feel better, then I'm really on to focusing on minimizing sugar, not not a high refined carbohydrate diet at all. So to some degree, gestational diabetes, we don't know what's necessarily causing it, but I do think that women can manage their blood sugar. And the better job they do of that in the second trimester leading up to being tested for gestational diabetes, the better shot they have of so not getting nut- it. So there's a nutritional element of what you do. Big, big nutritional element. And, and there are definitely herbs for managing blood sugar as well, but I wouldn't prescribe those unless I knew there was something going on mm-hmm. and they weren't taking. I wouldn't prescribe blood sugar lowering herbs in conjunction with, with like metformin or, or something yeah. else that right. they were taking. Or insulin. Well, insulin, then we're on to a whole other 
far more serious situation. That's right. pretty rare in my practice. Um, you know, it's rare, but I mean, I, in my practice, I don't see a lot of insulin for gestational diabetes, but um, it sort of depends who who their practitioner is, who their medical practitioner is. Yeah. Some of the practices are very conservative, and even with a little bit of spike in blood sugar, they like to insulin it down. Yeah, my preference would always be to try a dietary approach, like really give that a good try first. Absolutely. Um, what about itchiness, itchy belly and things yeah, like that? Yeah, itchiness is a big one that I've I've had quite a bit of success herbally with with the itchy stuff. Are some of the um, herbs topical or are they all tea and herbs? Herbs can, can easily be made into compresses. Um, there are other, yeah, there are plenty of topical herbs. There are companies that take Chinese herbs and turn them into topical solutions. Um or powders or that you make into a, a plaster or lotions or whatever. So Chinese herbs are definitely used in a topical way, or you can add them to a bath and take them in a bath. But a lot of times that itchy thing is coming from the liver and the gallbladder. And mm-hmm. so we treat the liver and the gallbladder herbally, and then most people are able oh, so to get cleanse. some relief. So we're, yeah, I mean, detoxing in pregnancy is not a good idea. And I would never recommend that anyone do that without working with a skilled practitioner, but it's very gentle cleansing. And again, with acupuncture and and herbs, we're looking at the energetics, not just the physical properties. So I'm not going to put somebody on a massive gallbladder cleanse, but I can put them on herbs that what we would say move liver chi or, or help the gallbladder to, to function a little bit better. To um, clear heat, what we you know that's a term that we would use in Chinese medicine to hear clear heat and stagnation from the liver and the gallbladder, and it sounds totally voodoo and weird because it doesn't align with what we're used to talking about in terms of medicine, but it's quite effective. Cholestasis. Cholestasis. Same, is same gallbladder. Same concept. You t- know that we would just that address it that way, and at some point it may not work. You know, I've had patients who've had their gallbladders removed while pregnant. It's mm-hmm. not ideal, yep. but it can be done. Um, but usually, if we catch it early, we can get in front of it. The hardest cases are when people call and say, you know, I have had a rash for nine weeks and I'm dying here and nothing's working and can't, you know, that's a lot to get in front of. It's always easier to get in front of things before they get too bad. What about uh, low hemoglobin or th- thrombocytopenia, low platelets? Sure. A lot of the herbs have um properties in them that will help the body's blood to be more nourished, to help increase hemoglobin, to help increase iron levels, and um, they ha- that have a good amount of iron in them. And again, we look at diet like crazy around that stuff as well, making sure that people are eating an iron-rich diet and um, using things like bone broth and mm. um, really mineral-rich foods to try to make sure that they're nourishing themselves properly because we don't live in a world that's about that. We think we can take a prenatal vitamin and cover our nutritional needs, and that's not true. I just have a patient right now who's like sort of risk out of a home birth because her hemoglobin is too low. Wow, and, that's uh, really too bad. I was thinking about her on my way here because, you know, it seems like Chinese medicine has solutions that are help build up your, your yeah. iron and your blood. But again, it would be something you'd want to look at earlier on if possible. If, at 37 weeks, it's probably, you're not going to convince 38. Him, 38. Yeah, you're probably not going to convince a midwife that you turned it around that fast. So right, you want to be starting on this stuff earlier, sooner, much earlier in pregnancy. Um, and then, oh, yeah, go for it. The herbs also then would help with immune function, I'm, I'm sure, Absolutely. also, which is something that's lower during pregnancy. Absolutely. Does that help, um, I guess, do you start that also earlier? Or is that something you just think about in general when you're treating a pregnant um, woman, it's or? something that I think about in general. It's something I think about seasonally as well. Okay. You know, like at this time of year, I'm really thinking about all my patients and um, what they're going to do going forward. So I'll have a lot more of them on immune supporting herbs or um, increase their vitamin D and, you know, supplements, looking at their supplements, looking at their diet, making sure they're getting enough sleep and rest. And, you know, it's it's a lot of reeducation that we can't just rely on NyQuil and or the flu shot. Or the flu shot, or you know all the different things that the West, that Western medicine throws at us as a way to suppress symptoms. Where it's much better to have a healthy microbiome and a healthy physiology moving into these. Then your body can manage it when it comes. How about hemorrhoids and varicose veins? Varicose veins are really hard to treat in pregnancy. I found if they're really painful, we actually um, sometimes will bleed them with a little lancet to just kind of like ease off some of the pressure, but it's awfully difficult to treat in pregnancy because 
as soon as somebody stands up again, they're kind of dealing with that same pressure on the veins. Mm -hmm. Hemorrhoids, um, I've had a lot of success helping women with hemorrhoids. How do you do it? Mostly with herbs, but also with acupuncture. Um, There's Mm -hmm. a technique of using, no, not right in. Okay. Not right in. No. <laughs> it's already a pain uh, in the It arch. has to be some, yeah. some we channel. Use, we use points along the channel that relates to oh, lifting the energy yeah. in that region of the body. Remote control. <laughs> yes, precisely. I understand. I mean, it's a, it's a big problem. It is a big problem. And again, it's one of those things where it's if, if somebody comes in when they have the first sign of a hemorrhoid, we're going to have a much easier time than if they come in when they have an exploding hemorrhoid, you know, and they're in agony and they can, can't sit down. And yes, we can get in front of it, but it's, you know, it's um, sometimes and other times it's just management. So getting closer to labor, um, first of all, when labor, first uh, preeclampsia, mm-hmm. signs of preeclampsia show up, you know, you don't often have a lot of time to work with. Is that a time to check out the acupuncturist and, and are there things that you can do that sort of fend that off a little bit? Sometimes. I think it just depends, um, again, what the woman's overall state of health is and why it's happening. High blood pressure, oftentimes we can address and that's enough. But if somebody's heading into aggressively into a state of preeclampsia and their liver enzymes are changing and their platelets are dropping. And, you know, at that point, we kind of leave it to Western medicine because Western medicine is really acute trauma medicine at its core. And it really saves lives when it comes to that kind of thing. So sure, but even never... in Western medicine, in the pre-state, and sometimes they notice little changes here, a little bit of And by all means, change. at that point, uh, acupuncture, nutrition, stress management, Adequate rest, all of that stuff can play a role, helping with the um, water retention symptoms at that point. I know you do a lot to help prepare for labor mm-hmm. and birth. Uh, first of all, there's positioning things, helping a baby get into the ideal position. Um, and then also, as you get closer, sometimes, especially if you're up against a clock, a yeah. medical induction, that uh, people often seek out Chinese medicine for help trying to beat that clock. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about those two? Yeah. Well, positionally speaking, we do a lot of work with things like breech position. Um, I know you guys do a lot of that, too. There's a specific acupuncture point that we use, moxibustion, which is like a little herbal um, compressed kind of incense made out of a specific herb that's held over a point on the toe. And um, interestingly, it has a higher success rate for turning a baby into a cephalic position than the manual version. So it's certainly worth a try. And it's been studied in both Eastern and Western It has, and and it has similar outcomes. Although I did read a study that shows it has a much better efficacy in China. And I think that that's because there is no resistance in Mm -hmm. China Chinese medicine is viewed in equal, um, you know, equally with Western medicine. Mm-hmm. And so if the doctor tells you to do that, you don't think, oh, that's weird. You just do it. And so it does seem to work better there. That said, it is a really effective uh, method and it should be employed whenever possible. An issue we run into here is that we really want to do it at 32 or 33 weeks. And a lot of times women are not getting a positional ultrasound until 34 well, they weeks. They don't know they're, they're breach yet. Yeah. So that's a that's a bummer um, when women are working with midwives bummer who can actually feel they it. suspect it. You What's that? Bummer, bummer, bummer. That's yeah, a they're bummed it down. A Frank bummer. Frank bummer. <laughs> a Frank bummer. <laughs> what about? Is it the same for rotation? Can you get um, things that you can do if the baby is sort of leaning on mom's back, skull to skull to spine in a posterior? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, that's that's more of like a acupuncturist doula trick. I uh-huh, would say. I you know. Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit like put your leg up on this thing while I stick a needle in and do some moxa. Not every practitioner is oh, going to be that. I had a nickel for every time I heard that phrase. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a little like it's a little bit more creative than probably the average acupuncturist does on on a daily basis, or kind of using those rock and roll kind of positions that we see in the hospital while using needles, and so. I think being around birth a lot makes it a little bit more helpful. easy, yeah, helpful to kind of get that. So in the final weeks of labor, what kind of things in Chinese medicine for getting ready for birth or as we started to talk about uh, getting the birth ball rolling? I ideally like to work with patients starting at 36 weeks and see them weekly leading up to the, the due date, which we all like to put in air quotes because it's not real, mm-hmm. um, but they have all the pressure of due dates coming at them. So helping, I think that 
the onset of labor, if you look at the way all mammals go into labor, they go under the bed, they go in a dark corner of the stall, they find a cave. There's a very um, strong biological imperative to get quiet, to get calm, and to feel protected. And we have women who are running around in LA traffic and working until they're 40 weeks or more and on the phone and fixing their nursery and screaming and yelling. And life is not doesn't slow down for this process. So when I can start to see a woman at 36 weeks, I'm helping them to transition out of that state and starting to help them become the cat in the closet and start to think about things in the in terms of what their biology requires in order for them to make this transition. So I do that in conjunction with providing herbal medicine. And there's some classic formulas that we use. One, My favorite one is called Protect the Labor Worry-Free Powder. Oh. And we started around 36, 37 weeks. And provided all the way through until post dates. And then if a woman does go past her due date, then the acupuncture can get a little bit more aggressive in terms of more frequency. Sometimes I'll see people two, three days in a row. Um, I use cupping at that point. I use something called gua sha, which is using a tool to kind of scrape usually along the sacrum and mm. the lower back. It, it also has a similar effect to cupping, but it's a little bit more releasing of heat. Um, and then, you know, again, just working really, really hard at keeping that nervous system in check so that from that place of calm, they are able, their body is able to recognize that it's a safe time for labor to begin. So, I just know so many people come in for one visit to our office after, you know, they'll hear from the doctor, you have three more days and then we're going to induce you. Uh, and now, of course, a lot of these people are past due, so who knows what happens. But literally, I'll do the body work to loosen up their body, release some of the tight muscles, ligaments, tendons, open up the joints with adjustments, and then they get acupuncture, and they're off to the yep. <laughs> uh, labor and delivery unit, and they have their babies within 24 hours. It's kind of amazing. It is. So, it is amazing. Uh, it you is made amazing. a believer out of me. Um, <laughs> if someone's going to have a cesarean birth, are there things that you do specifically to prepare for that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, not um, not necessarily so differently. And I mean, I'm still going to provide them with herbs. I still want their body to be prepared in the same way. Um, I think it's a little bit more afterwards, the way that we work with them and helping them to heal, helping to make sure the milk's coming in, um, that they're getting the opportunity to bond with their baby right away to latch and um, kind of managing their recovery a little bit differently. Yeah. So how soon after somebody has a baby, either vaginal or cesarean, do you like to see them to help the body strengthen itself back up? I mean, it depends. If I have the privilege of being their doula or working with them all the way up until birth, I will sometimes even go to the hospital to see them um, if they're if the hospital is willing to let me do that. And if not, within the first week, ideally, you know, as, as soon as they're home, if possible. And then it's it's a tricky time. It's hard to retain patients during that time, and it's a time when they need it the most. So we offer home visits and things to try to at a discounted rate usually for Ooh. immediate postpartum patients just to try to keep that continuity of care going because there's such a lack of support for women. And, yes, and you address the emotional changes, the baby right. blues, anxiousness, depression as it comes up, uh, fatigue. Yeah, and kind of honoring it that like you have a right to feel anxious and, and a little bit sad right now. Well, I do. I'm Jewish. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you get to do me that way all the it's time. It's built in. <laughs> Uh, any, you have any last questions there? I've learned so much and then we can go for another hour and a half. Yeah. We'll I mean, have to have you back. We anytime. have to have you back anyway to talk about fertility because, uh, that's another sh very strong area for you. And you wrote a book about it. Feed I your did. fertility. Um, Kristen. Yes. Did you, uh, have any other questions? You had a kid, so I'm just an observer. No, I, I found all of it to be really interesting. Uh, are there herbs, since you do uh, help after also, mm -hmm. and it is such a hard time, is there, because I know, and especially in other uh, cultures, that 40 days after is like yeah. really imperative. Yeah. Are there things, do you do like anything for like a package or something to help women with certain herbs in that time? Or Absolutely. Yeah. Like I mean, everything from there are specific herbs we use that right away postpartum and then transitioning into herbs that are to kind of help resolve the lochia, bleeding, bring in the milk. Um, and then and then again, it kind of becomes case by case. If someone's really anxious, the herbs will be catered to that. If they have low milk supply, they would be catered to whatever condition it is that they're dealing with. So it's very individualized. Um, but I think that continuing to see your 
acupuncturist postpartum is really important because it's it's a really difficult time and and we're not set up anymore culturally to support women the way we used to chinese medicine has a similar concept called the sitting month you know at yeah. least 30 days. I mean, they, they go to some extremes that include, like, you don't get out of bed or wash your hair. Or and like most of us don't yeah. choose that part you may not find um, it so anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I, have a, I have one friend who actually really did it. Really? The whole thing, yeah. Is placenta consumption part of uh, Chinese medical? You know, you're, the answer is no. Really? It's a, it's a big misconception. It's there an American is thing. no literature PLT. in the Chinese um classics anywhere that equates consuming one's own placenta no with kidding. postpartum wellness. And the only reference to you, placenta is an herb in the materia medica of Chinese medicine, but uh, it's typically used in minuscule doses and typically in geriatric formulas. Oh, so the so placental placenta. consumption is actually not Chinese medicine. It's been, it's been used as such, but um, I've done a lot of research into this topic because I'm very curious about it. And talked to kind of the foremost expert in Chinese classical medicine, and she's a translator, and she wrote her dissertation on the placenta specifically and the use of placenta in Chinese medicine, and she said there are there are no references. Um, I find it to be delicious. Oh, good. So, but I'm not Chinese, so that makes sense. <laughs> Where can we find you online? Um, my my business is called Mother Nurture Wellness, and my website is mothernurturela.com. I want to thank you again so much for being here and sharing your expertise. My pleasure. Uh, at home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. If you have a topic you'd like us to discuss, send your suggestions to info at informedpregnancy.com and visit us online. You'll find lots more pregnancy and parenting media at informedpregnancy.com. I got a whole lot of questions for you This kid's gonna test my will I got a lot to learn and my baby's too